Okay, uh, one, two, three. Hey everybody, it's Bezad here, and today I'm joined with Levi from Dutil Denim in Vancouver, and uh, we're gonna do another one of these little uh, interview podcasts uh, once again. So uh, there's, I don't think there's gonna be any real direction here. We're gonna be mostly talking about denim and, and all things uh, raw denim related. So uh, without any further ado, uh, let me introduce you guys to Levi, or, or rather, l- uh, Levi, how, how about you introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah, can do. First of all, thanks for having me on the pad- podcast. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'm Levi. Like the jeans. I work at Dutil's Vancouver location. I've been working there for about two years, a little bit over two years now. Um, I've lived in Vancouver my entire life, studied philosophy at UBC, love denim, obviously, all, all things denim related. I don't know. How's that? Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, I mean, that's a the quick and short answer for us there. Um, so you said, uh, well, I, we mentioned that you're working at Dutil. Um, for those who don't know what Dutil is, uh, why don't you give us a little rundown on uh, the shop and, and maybe some of the history? Totally, yeah. Uh, Dutil Vancouver was the first location that opened. It opened in 2006. Uh, the founder of Dutil... He was, uh, he was a representative of an eyewear brand, and I guess sometime, uh, sometime around then when he was going from shop to shop looking for places to hold his brand, he realized that there was this giant niche market for denim that wasn't being tapped into, uh, at least to full capacity here in Vancouver. Mm-hmm. And so that was why Dutil Denim started, uh, like I said, about 12 years ago. Five years after that, uh, they opened their second store in Toronto. And then this past summer, we opened a store in Calgary. And so now we have three stores. Um, we carry a variety of brands. We carry probably 50% of our stuff is like real denim head, uh, like a selection of stuff. And then the other 50% is pieces that, you know, like some nudie washes and scotch and soda and pieces that people who aren't quite into the raw denim stuff yet will come in and buy or people who are trying to get away from raw denim and trying to move towards comfort can look into. So, yeah, we pride ourselves in carrying a lot of stuff. Uh, we offer tailoring and hemming services. We do chain stitch hemming, and we're one of the few people in Vancouver that does it. I don't know about Calgary and Toronto. Um, yeah, right on. I'm just trying to think who in if who if anybody in Calgary or Toronto does chain stitch hemming. I I, I pretty much just send everybody to you guys. Uh, I think I think you're right. I think that is it. Um, I, I, I would like to be, uh, if anybody knows and let me know and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always happy to, uh, spread that news around, but I, I believe that you are. Um, so, I mean, you, you provide all these really, really incredible services and, uh, you, one thing that, uh, I really love about you chill is how, uh, super specialized you guys are. Like, I know, I think you carry a few shirts at this point, but like, you walk into detail and it's literally floor to ceiling jeans. And uh, that's what I love about you guys. You guys are, are very dedicated to a specific product and uh, you guys are, 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 are very, very good at it. Um, I was going to ask you like why shop at detail, but I think I just answered that question uh, because you guys do know, uh, you, you guys know your way around, uh, uh, you know, jeans and, and jean culture, but for say a new customer, somebody who's looking to up their raw denim, maybe not even up their raw denim, just to get into raw denim or, or, or look for a good pair of jeans the first time. Like why would you shop at Dutil, say over a, a department store or a chain store? Well, like, what, what makes it so, what makes you guys so special over you know, the typical maybe mall experience? Um, well, I guess, yeah, to tap into what you were saying there, we're such a specialty store. Oftentimes people will come into our store, people who haven't heard of us before, they'll come in and you see their eyes just open. They look up, they see, we just have jeans all over the store. They see that we have a second floor where a tailor's operating and you'd be like, Hey, can I help you? And they'd be like, yeah, do you guys have jeans? And that's kind of like a running joke is because people are just so surprised by how many jeans we have. And yes, we do have some jackets and shirts now and stuff. And we're maybe starting to open ourselves up to that a little bit more, but we pride ourselves in being Vancouver's one-stop shop for jeans. And so that's a great uh, reason to come shop with us. Another, I think, is that, and this is a hard thing to talk about, you don't just wanna like boost up your own confidence and be like, oh, our customer service is incredible, but that's something that we pride ourselves in as well. And 
I can speak for myself and the rest of the team when I say that when people come in, we're looking for reasons to be able to connect with people. For example, there, there was a guy who came in. He was like maybe 20 years old or something like this. This is a couple of years ago. He comes in with a couple of his buddies. They're doing like a road trip uh, from, I think they were from L.A., Uh, And they come in and they're like super hyped on raw denim. And so I'm showing them around. They're looking at some of the rogue territory stuff. And then we connect just before they go. And one of these guys, Rennie Conti, shout out to him. He's this musician. He plays music. And so I've been downloading like all of his albums. I let him know what I think about his albums. And I think that kind of stuff is so cool. And as it happens, a lot of people tend to think of retail in a really negative manner. And they think like, oh, retail, it's like it's a really poor way of connecting with people because you only have those chance encounters. But I think it's what you make of it. And so when these people come in, we're looking for opportunities to connect with people beyond denim, although denim is a great thing to share in as a community. But yeah, people come in and we're just looking for like, we're looking for friends. <laughs> right. So I think that's the utile experience. I'm just thinking back. I think you just said something very interesting about, you know, some people's maybe their their viewpoint on retail in general. And I mean... I'm going to say, you know, within the last 10 or 15 years, we've watched retail just kind of, I wouldn't say nosedive, but we've seen a lot of retail, like big companies close, even little companies. And, you know, people are like, well, it's the online stores, it's this and that. And, you know, personally, I I don't believe in that. Like, I don't blame online for killing retail and I think like a shop like yours is a perfect example because you know you've opened up many shops across the country and I think you nailed it it's like it's 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 the way you connect with your audience you know that keep people coming back when you have your local even if it, let's boil it down to your local cafe right you know you walk downtown of any major metropolitan area and there's there's a hundred cafes but you go to the one that you like because the one that you like serves you the best and i I think it's the same way with a denim shop like if if you have a place that you go for jeans you go for suits you go for shoes like you go to that place and so long as you're delivering that experience with customers um i think you're going to flourish i think that's the real it's, there's something a lot of people leave out of that argument uh, when, when they're talking about like the demise of retail. And, and, and anything yeah. to add there? Yeah, I think to your point as well, it's, yeah, I think it's funny that people like to blame online because I think that's coming to bite people in the butt now because they're realizing, I think customers anyways, customers are starting to realize that they want that experience that we're talking about, right? If someone was to come into Tate and Yoko and see that you guys like specialize in what you do and you guys are experts at what you do and they see that the staff that you have working there know exactly what they're doing and they can help you with your specific needs, you can't get that online and you certainly couldn't get it in department stores. And so I think there's really good hope for smaller stores like Tate and Yoko and Dutil and some of these other guys because you can't replicate that experience anywhere. Right, like if you walk into a mall store you know, I don't know. I mean, I don't walk into these stores very often, but you know, sometimes I, I go and uh, you're, you're dragged in, or you know, some generally, genuinely, sometimes I'm just curious to see what's going on. So uh, I walk in and I see what's happening, and you know, you pick up a pair of jeans, and then there's this giant line uh, for the change room, and the only person, the person at the change room, their job is just to give you a number and tell you which change room to come in and out of. So nobody's making sure that the product that you're wearing is fitting you right or making recommendations. Whereas you walk into like Tati and Yoko or you walk into Dutil, it's, it's really the other way around. I, when the customer comes out of that change room, we're there to make sure this is the right size. We're going to make sure that that cuff is rolled up perfectly for you. And you know, if we don't think it's the right jean for you, we're going to make that recommendation and say, I think this jean in this size or in this fit or in this fabric is going to be more in line with what you're looking for right a lot of people miss that out uh, and miss, miss miss out on that and uh well i guess they're not in business anymore <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah. and to to add on to what you're saying as well there's uh it's frequently the case that someone will come in and you kind of get an idea of what they're looking for or maybe they're looking for a specific brand and you know you don't carry it but someone else in the neighborhood does there tends to be i think like in any metropolitan area this toxicity between people who carry like overlap especially in specialty goods but for me like a customer comes in 
And for all of our staff, in fact, a customer comes in and they're saying they're, they're looking for this cut or this brand. And it's like, hey, these guys down the road carry that. You should go check it out. Let them know that I sent you. And, right. you know, best of luck. Yeah, it, it's a community thing. Like, you're not wrong. There, that totally exists in, in the retail world where it's like this brand exclusivity thing. And, you know, to some degree, you know, you don't want to oversaturate a market, right? Like, you can't. But, you know, I always think about it this way. If, if store A is carrying, you know, brand, like, you know, I'm trying to come up with examples, but if two stores next to each other are carrying, whether they're carrying the same brand or not, they're carrying the same commodity, right? Mm -hmm. So whether you, oftentimes I feel like, unless it's very, very specific and people are coming in for a very specific item, you know, the general consumer comes into the store and, I'm looking for a new pair of jeans and they're there to see what you have to offer. And I think it generally boils down to customer service because if they walk into, you know, store one or store two, they're both going to have jeans. They're both going to have yeah. shirts or, you know, all these basic items that, that yeah, we're men, you know, we, there's our wardrobes aren't as, uh, <laughs> as we don't have as many options as women do, you know, it's like, uh, but you know, a work shirt's a work shirt. I'm not going to say, you know, of course, quality is, is there. But, you know, if you're w look, walking into similar level or type of shops, you're going to find similar quality goods. And I think it just boils down to the service and, you know, how that staff is able to connect with that customer more than it is about the product that is carried in the store. Yeah. Right. Totally. Totally agree. Um, oh, here's a good question. W what jeans are you wearing right now? Currently? Yeah. I'm wearing... <laughs> I hope you're wearing jeans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what if I'm not? Oh, no. Uh, I, <laughs> I am wearing LVC 501s from 1947, or at least the replica of the 47 model. Right, the, uh, the LVC model. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And, yeah and, right. and why did you pick those ones? Because you're named after them? Well, kind of, actually. <laughs> no, it's not even a joke. I, um, yeah, I mean, I got these a little bit over a year ago. And prior to that point, I had owned a bunch of different pairs of jeans. Obviously, I've been in the whole raw denim thing for maybe, oh, geez, uh, five years, maybe something like that. And so I'd owned a ton of different pairs of jeans, but I'd never owned any Levi's. Reason being that I feel like the Levi's, at least mainstream line, is headed downhill the way that they're trying to accommodate for too much. And they're doing everything. They just released a 501 skinny not long ago. And so I was kind of disappointed with that. Having known about the Heritage line, though, the LVC stuff, I was thinking, man, this would be such a great time to invest in a pair. Because, I, I don't know, there's a sweet irony in the fact that my name is Levi, and I could own a pair of Levi's that I'd actually be, like, re really proud of, and a pair that I'd, like, see to my grave with me. And so it just felt like the next right step, I guess. And as well, I've kind of been moving more towards looser fits, and so this 501 fit, I actually really dig aesthetically as well. Cool. I I'm also really into looser fits and uh it's uh it's a wave that i find like it's coming and mm. i'm a i'm on reddit a lot I, I i chat with our customers a lot on instagram and, and things like that and it's often sometimes i'll like for example we put up a photo of the we have our new fit called the strong guy which is like a wide yep. straight high rise you you guys have it and uh so I put the photo up and not that I, I mean, we usually don't get a lot of negative comments on posts, but this one seemed to attract more negative comments than maybe, you know, the typical uh, negative. No, we get a lot of good comments, but, you know, of course, this is the internet. Right. So yeah. <laughs> just, just way more. And people were really angry at like wide straight or wide fits. And I'm like, why are you so angry? Like, it doesn't mean you can't buy a skinny fit for yourself. Sure. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I look at our sales and I see, you know, if it's like the easy guy, just like really taking off. And I see guys in the industry, you know, myself, you and, you know, you go to a trade show and like anybody who's wearing jeans is wearing here, maybe not everybody, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote, say, like some of the some of the more forward thinkers, um, sure. forward dressers are wearing wide leg jeans. Um how is that in the shop right now? Like, how do you see customers shopping for jeans? Are they are they hesitant towards this wide leg movement that I 
definitely see coming or is it just like a still a niche kind of like fashion forward customer that's into it yeah i think it's still a niche market however us like the owners here the manager myself my coworkers, we're starting to see that it's coming in i mean being able to see you guys work on fits like the strong guy in the classic that for us is indication because we know that you guys know what you're doing and we know that you guys can forecast pretty well but even in yeah in my personal kind of the reddit browsing and stuff i'm seeing that like those kinds of fits are coming in as well and so i think us as a brand are forecasting it and i think our customers are starting to see that niche as it may be at this point anyways but i think in the next couple of years it's going to it's going to be really big and i think interestingly uh, i think that the women are catching onto this trend first especially cuz people like so many women are coming in and they want like a just like a classic indigo straight leg jean. And we point them at the classic every time. And they really dig it. And we're starting to get more fits like that in from different brands as well because everybody's catching on. And so I think men are going to start following uh, after women's footsteps for this trend, actually. Hmm. And I think they're going to they're gonna take a look there. Yesterday, actually, a guy came in. He was wearing some Muji pants. They look like Stan Rays. They were like the typical fatigue pant. And so he said that he was looking for some straight leg fits. He tried on the strong guy. He was trying on a couple different fits. And then I threw a classic over his door and he tried it on. And he's like, hey, my payday is a couple days from now. I'm going to come back and grab these. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, you know, jeans are jeans. Whether like the classic fit for us for women, it, it opened up a lot of doors. Like you know, our women's line has always been kind of small, but that classic fit has just been really yeah. taking off a lot. And I see a lot of like, our Instagram, we're getting more and more women like posting, uh, uh, you know, with using our hashtag as well. So I'm always sharing those photos and I, I like to see it. I, I feel like a lot of the women who get into Naked and Famous maybe got influenced by their boyfriends or their husbands or, you know, a guy who was like a raw denim guy. Yeah. And they're like, oh, you should try on raw denim jeans. And it's interesting because, you know, while they were influenced by that, I think also in maybe mainstream like contemporary fashion for women there's a lot of this dry denim or raw denim look going on as well so i think we're at a really interesting time for women in raw because i'm i'm thinking back to like you know 2008 to 2012 where like the heritage wave really hit menswear in a big way and it's not a heritage wave that's hitting women because you're getting these like very fashion forward styles, mm -hmm. but using like 100% cotton raw jeans or raw denim rather. And it's warming women's eyes to this and maybe more eyes are coming to us. And I think that's why, or partially the reason why the classic is, is doing so well. Totally, know, yeah. Just my thoughts there. I think we're seeing like a crossroad for women anyways in like you're saying that kind of high fashion, forward thinking, fashion and then this like heritage and I think it's going to meet at an apex really really soon and I think as you're describing it already is starting to right I also wanted to talk about so with with my my vision is that why jeans are they're they're going to be part of hmm how should I say this they're going to be part of the the game you know like for a long time and I mean it's been a while since skinny jeans like it's pretty much all been skinny jeans for guys for i don't know like almost 15 years i'm gonna say like yeah. like no bootcut jeans no wide leg jeans like those jeans really disappeared from like the fashion forwardness you know even in the fashion forward scenes you really didn't see like those kinds of fits anymore no. and now I'm seeing wide legs again in the fashion forward kind of scenes and it's trickling down. You see it in streetwear, you see it in skatewear a lot too. Um, yeah. But I wonder if it'll hit like a mainstream like it did in the 90s when I was growing up where it was mm. only wide leg and baggy jeans. Like I, I remember specifically like as a kid, just, you know, going junior high and high school, it was like, when you go shopping for jeans, like the only thing that I cared about was baggy. Like if these were baggy, that <laughs> yeah. was, that was the selling feature for me. Yeah. I, but I wonder, is that, is that, yeah, you know, I see a nineties wave again, it, uh, oddly enough, I don't know why I keep 
like, you know, I see uh, mostly women. Again, I guess women are always a little more fashion forward. Like, I see a lot of, like, I'm in the metro a lot. You know, I live downtown, so I see a lot of young people around, especially, like, university kids. And, uh, man, it looks like when I was in high school, like, they're, they're wearing, like, uh, you know, tube tops and spaghetti straps and, like, yeah. you know, uh, I don't know all the... But it, it's really interesting. So I want, But the guys aren't following suit in the same way, like, the mainstream customer... But I, I, yeah, the, I don't know. That's interesting. But you're right. I totally see it in like the, the feminine world, but I don't see it in the masculine world much. But this like, yeah, people are almost paying homage to the 80s and 90s anyways. Even still, though, I think that it's a it's a more refined, maybe more cultured take on what happened back then. I don't feel like it's imitation. They're taking some of those pieces and they're they're starting to dress them up. And there's this more there's more of this like hybridization of maybe streetwear. Like it's it's more of a melting pot now, I guess. Fashion people are starting to find their individuality by mixing so many different trends. It feels like right. Like for me, when I see these kids, I think these kids are like they're the more fashion forward kids. Whereas when I was a kid, that's what just everybody wore. Like I, right. I didn't I didn't think I was fashion forward when I was a kid. I just thought I dressed. Because, you, you know, I mean, high school and whatnot, like, you just had to fit in. Like, so you just kind of wore yeah. what everybody else wore. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how, I don't know where that's going, but. No. <laughs> it's just a, it's a, a funny observation, I guess. Um, maybe, maybe a little more uh, back, back to denim and, uh, uh, you know, raw denim talk. Um, so when you take care of your jeans, um, what kind of, do you have any special routines, uh, you know, because, you know, in the raw denim world, there's so much, uh, so many ideas of how the best way to take care of your jeans. What's yeah. Levi's recommended way of taking care of a pair of raw oh, denim geez. jeans? Okay, everyone pull out your notebooks. This is important. <laughs> um, I think you might agree with me here, um, but I feel like my preference towards caretaking denim has really just... It stopped to be so, or it stopped being so specific. Like when I first got into raw denim, I was following all the heddles guides and I needed to know exactly what to do, what temperature, how long. Whereas these days, I kind of just wear my jeans and I wash them when they need to be washed. Right. <laughs> Which is maybe sacrilegious. I don't know. I, I think that everybody goes down that route. It's what it like, feels like. Because when you get into raw denim, you do a lot. I remember just getting in and like I was getting into this, you know, maybe 15 years ago. Um, but the information was very scarce. So, you, you know, whatever information I could find, like that was the letter of the law. But right. now there's so much more information, but still a lot of this maybe misinformation keeps getting passed on. Um, yeah. But like for me, what I always tell people is if you want a really high contrast fade, that is you have, you know, your creases, they're really bright compared mm -hmm. to the to the other parts of your jeans. Wear your jeans as long as you can yeah. before washing them. You know, six months, eight months. But you have to also wear them hard. It's you know, if you're working behind a, a desk at the office and you wear your jeans for six months, it's not the same as you know a bike courier or, or you know oh. or somebody who works in a warehouse. So wear your jeans really rough and tough, and then they're ready for a wash. And the more you wash them and like the more heat and the more dryer you, you apply to that jean, the more they'll fade. So yeah. if you want to keep them darker, less frequent, frequent washes in cold and hang dry. And the more you want them to fade, more frequent washes, hotter the water, hot dry. And you can hot dry your jeans. They're, they're not going to die, but they're going to no. fade, right? They, they're yeah. jeans. They're tough. They can handle it. But... Uh, <laughs> And then everything else in between is a spectrum. Like, how much do you want to do it? But, uh, you know, ha, ha, like, for exa example, have you ever uh, uh, done an ocean wash? Have you ever jumped in the ocean with your jeans? I never did an ocean wash, no. But only because cause there was a phase in my life where I would have done an ocean wash. Now, I don't know if I would. It feels a bit too gimmicky to me. Mm. But there was a phase in my life. I just didn't ever have, like, the right progress on a pair of jeans where I felt like, okay, it's time for an ocean wash. Right. Oh, I, I did do that, though. I've definitely done it. And, How many? Uh, I did it one time. And interestingly enough, what I liked about the ocean wash wasn't so much that 
like I, I'm washing them in the ocean and I thought like this, this, the sea salt was going to do something special to them, but it was actually like getting out of the water and then getting into the sand. And then I would just like rub the sand into my jeans. And yeah. I felt like that, like was just enough abrasion to like lighten the jeans up, you know, where I wanted it, like on the knees or behind yeah. my knees or on my lap, that type of thing. And yeah. I, I think it worked. So like as far as like ocean washing, like I'm I'm gonna co-sign on that one and be like that's like I would I would say that do it if you want to do it and it'll only it, it's a fun story but it'll also like improve your fade yeah in my opinion of course um, yeah. but like you know putting your jeans in the freezer or things like that uh, I don't think those do anything. No, I did the freezer. Uh, yeah, I put some, I put a pair of my nudies in the freezer, um, and my nudies just came out and smelled like my freezer. Right. So yeah, unless yeah. <laughs> and and they, and they were cold. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's funny actually. There was a customer who came in the other day uh, to get a pair of his jeans repaired, and typically we say that we want people to wash their jeans before they bring them in, just for sanitary reasons. Mm -hmm. And so this guy brought it in, brought in his jeans. And they had this feel to them as if they had just been washed, almost like wet or either like they had never been washed or they had just been washed. And so I said, oh, have these been washed recently? And at the same time, I was smelling like it smelled like a vegan smoothie or something. And so I was like, have these been washed? He's like, oh, I tossed them in the freezer. And I was like, oh, that's why it smells like vegan smoothie. <laughs> but, that, but that's not a wash. <laughs> <laughs> no. He said he had washed them as well. So uh, <laughs> we, we have the same thing like... Uh... Yeah, like we won't take in a pair of jeans that, like, you got to think about it. Like, if you're doing repairs or that type of stuff, like, nobody wants to deal with your sweaty crotch. Like, no, you can deal with your sweaty crotch, <laughs> but if you're like, have some courtesy to the person who's repairing your jeans. So, yeah, nobody wants your like, we'll just wash your jeans if you're gonna have them repaired. Just do everybody a favor. Yes. And odds are they're, they're, they're probably falling apart because you're not washing them enough. So uh, Exactly. Yeah. So do yourself a favor. Right. Um, what else do we got here? I, I had, uh, of course, I always have a couple of questions prepared, but uh, I, I like the flow of our conversation. Um, like, you got into raw denim jeans uh, like five years ago. Um, have you or like have you how do your friends react to this are, are they raw denim people too or they just think you wear stinky jeans <laughs> um yeah well i here's my origin story briefly so i got into raw denim through a friend because it's always through a friend either through a friend or because you need a 36 inseam or because you need a jean that's not going to wear out those are the three reasons and so my reason was the first one there's a buddy of mine david bain back in university he, I guess he had just found out about raw denim recently and he was like, dude, you have to check this out. And then I realized he was talking about fades, something I'd never thought about, even though I had like some Levi's 511s from, I don't, you know, like $80 Levi's 511s or something. And I went home and I realized, oh, these jeans have faded too. And it's actually kind of cool. And so I kind of wanted to take that to the next step. And so I got a pair of unbranded and the rest is history. So that's my origin story. What do people think about raw denim? I mean, I'm not, at least now anyways, maybe not when I started, but now I'm not like the biggest denim advocate and I'm not like, mom, never wash my jeans, please. It's, you know, my attitude has shifted a bit. And so I'm a bit more accommodating. I still get really excited when I talk about raw denim, raw denim pardon me. Uh, and in fact, my cousin just the other day decided to buy his first pair because every time he'd come over, he'd be like, oh, what jeans are you wearing? And then we'd start conversing about denim. Then he hopped on Reddit and spent probably too much time there. And so... Yeah, I think I try and be like a healthy influence and I try and more than I'd like to talk about the fades and how cool they look, I'd prefer to talk about how they are really, um, they're eco-friendly and they actually help out like smaller artisans like you guys who are based in Canada who, you know, need to raise their prices in order to afford the kind of like quality uh, or like ethical work quality that you guys are doing. So, yeah. But, but our prices are still the best. Well, they are the best. I know. <laughs> it's crazy. But for some who like to buy H&M jeans that are $25, right. it's still a bit of a stretch. Right. In our world, we're very well priced. I mean, sometimes I see these commercials for, like for, you know, the, 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 the mall chain stores and stuff and like jeans, fourteen ninety nine this weekend only. And I'm like, it, it just shocks me. 
because I'm like, how could you have a finished jean, fabric, <laughs> sewing, delivery, everything for fourteen ninety nine? Like, you know, it, it freaks me out because yeah. it, naturally I know what, what it costs to make a jean, and mm. like even if I were to cut every possible. To be fair, I know exactly what corners to cut, and there yeah. those are not the ethical ones yeah. um, to make a jean that price. But I just think to myself, like, it's insane that we can get a garment, a finished garment, at that price point, and still have room for a commercial. Yeah, like there's still margin in there for the commercial. Yeah, crazy. It's crazy. <sighs> No, I'm just losing my thought, train of thought, because I got a little on, I went on a tirade there. Um, (laughs) Well, fellow fellow denim nerds, you know, we like to talk about uh, our jeans, but we also like to obsess uh, about the details. So Mm -hmm. what kind of details do you really appreciate in a jean? Like, what do you look for uh, when you look at a jean, you pick it up and you think to yourself, this is definitely worth the money. I think my answer to this would have been different even a year ago, but definitely two years ago or so. Um, More or less recently, I'm into really heritage stuff, and so I really dig these 501s that I'm wearing. I'm going to Japan in November, and when I go, I'm really looking forward to just checking out some of these brands that are doing, like TCB, the guys who are doing the really close replicas. And so like specific details don't matter to me as much as just picking up a jean and feeling like, feeling like, wow, this feels like a heritage brand gene right here. And yeah, I guess like as time has gone on, I've become less picky about details just because I'm looking for, I'm looking like, that's the thing is back in the day, back in like the the forties, fifties, sixties, men weren't going to a store and being picky about which jeans they were going to try. Right. It was like, I need a pair of pants that are going to last me through the next, you know, two, three years or whatever. And I'm not going to be careful about tossing them in the dryer or not. And I'm certainly not going to, toss them in the freezer and I like that attitude and right. I think that that's the attitude one should have about denim yeah I mean they were buying jeans because they were going to do it, it wasn't something that they weren't wearing well after maybe after the 40s they were they started to wear them because they were cool but before that it was right. like I'm going to work in these or you know I'm going to go work in the field or like this is for casual Saturday like it wasn't a matter of style it was just you know, it's like, would you wear a coverall today if you weren't going to do real workwear? And the answer is somebody probably would, but you know, yeah. the, 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 most of us wouldn't, um, yeah. unless it was like for fashion. But yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, it's a good a good way to think about that. So when you when you talk about heritage details, like what are you looking for? Is it like the stitching? Is it uh, do you want to see replicas of old stuff, or do you want to see like a new way how can i say this because some to me i I see a lot of replicas and yeah i don't know how i feel about them exactly because to me especially because you know the brands that they're replicating are still around today and i think to Mm -hmm. myself what i don't see i do I, i can see the passion in that but Something about it feels like I'm not using my imagination so much. Like, I'm, I don't have to design something myself. I just have to copy what's already been done. And yeah. so for me personally, it's not as interesting. Um, so maybe I'm asking you, like, what do you find interesting about this type of product? Right. Um, hmm. I guess just... I like the way that it recalls history and I like the way that there's a story built into the gene. Well, maybe there's not a story built into like a TCB gene, right? The point is that it was built to look like a Levi's and now you have it. But there are certain, like these LVCs, I think is the closest, closest thing to history that I'm ever going to get unless I buy a pair of actual authentic vintage Levi's, which my wallet can't afford, unfortunately. And so I like the idea that I'm buying something that at least represents the narrative of a different era. So I like the idea that I'm buying something that represents the story of a culture of people who were just buying jeans because like we said, they just needed to get through the day and they needed something that would last for them. I like brands like Vetra, for example, a French brand, 
that has been passed on from generation to generation and whose original owner had to burn down his shop and flee from the Germans as they were invading France. That kind of stuff I think is so cool. And so I think to be able to to rep or to wear a brand and represent a brand that that has that sort of story, uh, I think is really cool. Right. So more of the history of the product or maybe what the, the history of what that product represents is what's yeah. more interesting to you than maybe uh, the stitching quality or the type of rivet that they put on. Yes, All definitely. Right. Yeah. It's an interesting and the, take. And the cut. Because right. like I said, I'm into wider cuts now. And so I'm looking for something that feels authentic and cut and something that is also really comfortable. Great. How, are, how, how do you feel about boot cuts? <sighs> l- let, me, let, me, let me preface this because <laughs> I think when people talk about vintage jeans, there's this cutoff point. Mm-hmm. There's this cutoff point at like 1959 and they think that everything after 1959 doesn't count as like <laughs> heritage or or like vintage jeans. They think that the 1960s and 70s just didn't happen. And right. like I like bootcut jeans and yeah. you know I like that rock and roll kind of style, that hippie style. Yeah. Like I really like that. And anyways, like you know again, when I when I when I hear people talk about vintage jeans it's always like the cutoff date is 1959 you know december 31st at 11 59 p.m after that <laughs> forget about it yeah that chunk of 20 years didn't happen right where the boot cuts were in right um i don't know like we had the groovy guys in when you did them and i forget what fabric it was but we had brought in one of the fabrics in the groovy guy that you'd done and honestly i had never tried them on i didn't give them a chance which i know is bad I've seen you wear the groovy guys, and I think you rock them, actually. I think you look really good in them. And when I see you wearing them, I think to myself, okay, maybe there's a chance. But I think I'm going to wait for that to naturally evolve in the same way that love, like my love for classic straighter leg fits evolved. And probably two years ago, I couldn't have seen myself wearing a 501 in the same way. Now, I can't see myself wearing a boot cut. But who knows? I'm open to it. Right. And I accept that part of history took place. Right. I, I don't personally believe that like the boot cut is going to hit us back in the same way that like a the skinny jean hit the market or like how maybe I perceive the straight leg fit is going to hit. Like, you yeah. know, if you want a boot cut, like for me, it's like if you're like a, you know, a vintage, you know, if you're like a rock and roll kind of musician or, or uh, an eccentric um or you just like vintage style. Like I, you know, I have like uh, a lot of sixties and seventies inspiration. I like, you know, uh, 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 tie dye shirts and like, you know, interesting embroideries on jackets and that type of thing. I love that vibe. And like, I always see it from the waist up, but like waist down, I'm like, come on, man, (laughs) put on some like, you know, cool boot cuts and like, let's, let's really live it up again. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I was thinking to myself that, Maybe it wasn't fair to say that all men just like to cut off, or all men and women like to cut it off at 1959 because they're like boot cut jeans. At least this is what I was thinking a second ago. Were at least during the disco period, sort of made as a it was like a design choice and something that was stylistic, right? Whereas well, like the Levi's 501, well, yeah, the Levi's 501s were just a straight fit that you know every man wanted to wear. But I was thinking about it there for a second, and the boot cuts were of course made to fit over boots, and so there is a very utilitarian history to it as well. So I might have to confront this in my personal life. I don't know. Right. I mean, other people also, they, they, they get boot cut and like flared like bell bottoms, like conflated. Like, like the groovy guy is not a bell bottom. Like it's not going right. to cover your entire shoe. Yeah. Um, and like, I mean, that was the evolution of the boot cut during that era for sure. But, uh, you know, you look at all these old pictures of, like, Led Zeppelin or even the Beatles and, like, you know, they're wearing, like, these cool bootcut jeans. And I'm like, I, I, I don't know. Like, when people think vintage, it's just, like, James Dean. And James Dean right. looks great in jeans, don't get me wrong. But um, uh, there's, like, this spot in history that forgets about the bootcut. And I wish, I right. wish like, the, her- the guys who really appreciated heritage, like, I wish they would see it a little, you know, look a little bit past uh you know 1959 a little bit more not just selectively view the parts that they want to right 
yeah, that's fair. That's fair. All right, good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we covered that. You're going to convert uh, me. I'm, I'm going to try little by little. I want, I want, you know, people to, I want, I just want the heritage guys to, to like, be like, yeah, boot cuts are part of it. Like, and not just like, never mention that, never mention that bit. It's like, right. you know, the, 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 I'm trying to quote like uh, uh, the name that should never be. I think that's from Harry Potter, right? I've oh, never read. Oh. I've never read Harry or I've never read Harry Potter or seen even a single one of their movies. So <laughs> I'm like the last one. But yeah. uh, there's this. How, how does that line go? I don't know. The he who shall not be named. I think. Yes, that's it. That's what boot cuts are to the heritage right. <laughs> uh, crowd. <laughs> um, okay. Well. Um, I think we covered some of those. I mean, we talked about some of the raw data myths and uh, maybe just, I don't want to end on a negative point. Well, I'm going to ask you two more questions. Um, sure. Like, what do you hate about raw, de raw denim? Good question. <laughs> um, I guess two things. And the, the former one, the first one that I'm going to say here, I don't hate as much as the second one. The second one I do really hate. So the first one being the discomfort. Um, and I think the, this first one here ties into the second one, and I'll do that tie in a second. But yeah, raw denim can just be so uncomfortable, especially if you're sizing the way that a lot of these uh, places like Heddles and uh, like uh, where a lot of this raw denim lore started, I feel like a lot of those guys suggest that you need to buy your jeans so that they fit super duper tight and you have to size down because they're going to stretch out. And that's just a really uncomfortable process, and I've been there, and I really disliked it. The second thing is all of the rules surrounding raw denim. There are so many people who are saying that there's a certain way that you have to wear and do raw denim, and I don't think that's right. And so you have all of these places, especially online, because the online atmosphere has been a great way to circulate information about anything, raw denim being one of those places or one of those things. And so you have the online, like, raw denim communities, Sufu, stuff like that, and they're all circulating information and people are feeling like, okay, there's only one way to do this. Even when customers come into Dutil, they'll pick up a pair of Naked and Famous and at the till to be like, oh, so how do I wash these? And it's like, well, there's many different ways you could, you could wash them as frequently as you like. And I usually give the kind of tips that you had mentioned earlier where it's like if you want really high contrast fades, wait off as long as you can and like cycle in them, do as much as you can in them. If you don't care about that as much, then wash them whenever they're dirty. But there are just so many rules. It feels like there's so many rules and so many people who, so many like raw denim police who are enforcing these rules. When I think like the, I guess I think they're missing the point. The point is that you're buying a high quality pair of denim because you're sick of all the other stuff. You're sick of this like fast fashion world that is encompassing everything that we do. And you just want a good pair of jeans that are going to last you a long time. So just wear them, beat them, wash them, do whatever you need to do to them. So I think that's the thing that I dislike most. Right. And I would agree with you on m pretty much all of that, I would say. Like, I think the internet breeds some bad information, especially mm -hmm. about sizing. Um, you know, and I, and I think most of it stems from, you know, there's, there's this idea of sizing down. That goes around a lot. And what people don't realize is that it's sizing down from like your actual waist size. So mm -hmm. like there's the true, to, like the, the waist measurement, you, the waist measurement of the jean, your waist measurement. And yeah. then there's the tag size. And, you know, the tag size is always uh, uh, smaller than what the actual waist size is. So, yeah. you know, say like, the, the, the reasoning behind this, this size down thing is they, they'll say to you, well, if you're a 32, like your actual waist is a 32, then you probably need a size 30 or a size 31 jean because the actual waist measurement on that jean is probably a 32, maybe a 32 and a half, 33, something like that. So that's where that mentality comes from. But what a lot of people forget is that, or what people don't realize is that the size of jean that you wear isn't necessarily your waist size. So right. people think, oh, well, I wear a size 32 jean. That means I should size down two, so I should buy a 30 because that has a 32-inch waist measurement. 
but you forget that that size 32 jean that you're wearing probably has a waist measurement of 33 and a half or 34. So you just, it, it goes all over the map. And yeah. then another thing people really forget is that the rise matters. Yeah. Right? People forget right. about this a lot. And they're like, well, why is the waist measurement on this fit different than on this fit? I'm like, that's because the rise is different. So they hit you at yeah. a different place. Like, yeah. Your waist measurement, where's your waist? Is it your hip? Is it two inches above your hip? Is it two inches below your hip? Anywhere in between? But that's, I mean, jeans can hit you anywhere. So that's why there isn't a standardized sizing in the yeah. world or for brand to brand. It's because everybody makes their jeans designed to fit a certain way based off of a certain measurement. So anyways, that's, that's where all that confusion comes from. And it's hard to, I mean, I've tried to correct it a lot, um, but mostly I tell people, whatever the tag size it is that you you normally wear, that's probably the tag size you're gonna need. And yeah. if you're unsure, especially if you're shopping online, measure a pair of jeans that you own yeah. and compare those measurements to the size chart on the website. And then, you know, based on that, you can kind of figure how these jeans are gonna fit you. And don't buy jeans a little too small, hoping that they're going to stretch out enough because that almost yeah. never works. And then you're just in like discomfort zone, uh, as, yeah. as, you, as you mentioned. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's 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 definitely a frustration in our world. And I think it's not just for like retailers because, you know, we're having to deal with like customer complaints all the time. But I mean, yeah. it's probably a yeah, customer complaint. We deal with that every day. That's no problem for us. But I mean, if you're a customer and you just spent $150 or $200 on a pair of jeans that don't fit, that really sucks. Like, totally. I, I, you know, uh, I can, I'm all, I'm annoyed, you know, sometimes I'll buy like a new gadget and it sucks and it annoys me, but it works, but it just sucks. But yeah. like, you know, imagine buying a, a piece of clothing that you're just struggling to get into. It's, it's, it's the worst. It's a horrible feeling. So yeah. So. On that conversation of rise too, that's interesting because I feel like women have been on the, they, women tend to have rise on their mind when they come in to buy a jean. At Dutail, they'll come in, you'll say, what are you looking for? And they'll mention all the specifics, like the color, the, um, the fabric, what it feels like, what kind of fit they want. And they'll always mention the rise too. For women, it's always mattered. Whereas men, only recently I've started to notice that they're asking like, hey, like, you know, my butt kind of falls out of this, or this is really uncomfortable in the crotch. They're starting to at least realize that you can, start to amend some of those problems just by fixing the rise and choosing a gene with a different rise. Right. So it's interesting. That's only a realization that I've had in the past two years, probably anyways, where I've started to want stuff with a higher rise for comfort reasons. Yeah. I mean, I remember when things went like really low rise for a lot. I mean, that was like the mid two thousands. Everything was low. Everything had to be low rise, low rise, low rise, low rise. It's ridiculous. I remember yeah. in like, I, cause I, I, I worked in a denim shop and we had these women's jeans with like seven inch or six inch rises on them. And it was like, it was like that. It was so yeah. tiny and like they would have a zipper on them and that would like go like one inch, like just this right. tiny little zipper. And I'm like, why, why did you even bother to waste time putting a zipper here? It doesn't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm glad those days are over. But, yeah. Uh, I think most people are. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe they'll come back one day. <laughs> uh, whatever. Um, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna close it out with. I think maybe this is gonna be my new closeout question. I think it's a great question. Okay. What would your dream jean be? <laughs> hmm. Dream jean. I would. I would want something that. Is pretty close to the 501, actually. I think there'd be a couple things I'd want to amend about a jean like this. The first being that I'd want it a little bit more heavyweight. Uh, at least there's things that I'd like to amend about this LVC replica. I don't know about the originals, but at least for this LVC 47 replica, I would like to see it with a slightly heavier weight denim, very slightly, maybe like an ounce or two. Uh, and I'd like to see some more texture to it, too. Like even the unsamphorized models, I feel like there's not quite enough there. And so I'd like to see with a bit more character. Um, and that being something that the Japanese have obviously introduced. So having this hybridization of the American historical accuracy and the Japanese innovation, I think having that. 
And then I'd like to see it taper just a little bit, especially because I'm not wearing these such that they're like extremely tight in the thigh. I don't like that. I'd like to see them just taper ever so slightly. And that's, I, I'm, I mean, for all of the things that I forego in denim culture, because I'm, you know, I'm so far gone now and I've seen it all and done it all. One of the things I still won't do is taper any of my denim. And so I would just like to see a cut that tapers a little bit more than this. So I think slightly more tapered than the 47, a heavier weight denim, and something that's a little bit more textured as well. Apart from that, I love all the historical details and the rise. Right on. Yeah, that, that's a good gene. Uh, <laughs> it's a popular fit, you know, right now. Like we have something called the Easy Guy. You, I'm sure you guys, you know about it. Wider in the thigh and with a sharp taper with a high rise. So like it's yeah. a hybrid of like, an old school kind of fit, but at the bottom, you've got that, you know, modern leg opening. Exactly. All right. Well, uh, on that note, um, Levi, why don't you tell, just to remind everybody where everybody can find you? Sure. Um, you can find me on Reddit, uh, operating as you slash, uh, denim shop. You can find us at dutildenim.com. You can find us on Instagram at dutildenim shop. Um, I'll leave my personals out of it, but please go check out do till denim, go check out what we have online, check out our Instagram, uh, hit me up on Reddit, Instagram. I'll be managing all those places so we can have a conversation and chat. That'd be really cool. Great. Well, Levi, thank you so much for joining me. I hope, uh, the viewers out there and listeners out there got to enjoy this one. Uh, I'll be back again at some point with another podcast. I got, I got to line these up. Uh, and uh, if you guys, uh, our listeners out there, have any questions or, or, or people you'd like me to talk to, uh, let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to like, uh, subscribe, and share and all that stuff. Uh, I don't know what it does, but I, I, every, every YouTuber says it at the end of every video. So, uh, so I'm going to say it too. And uh, I'll see you guys later. Thanks for joining. And, uh, and have a nice day. All right. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye.